All right, gents. Um, thanks for joining me today for this discussion. Basically, as I was just saying, Peters, Jordan Peterson's um, brought the issue of privacy and online anonymity to the fore over the last year or so. And he's been very critical of uh, anonymous accounts. And he's been very vocal about his, you know, basically desire to see them banned in some capacity or segregated or, you know, I, I see his comments as wanting to invoke authority to sideline or silence a certain cohort of people online that are engaging anonymously. And I have a lot of issues with that. I suspect many of you do as well. But in light of, you know, kind of the evergreen discussion around privacy, but in particular, and censorship in particular, as a result of the last two or three years in the COVID era, I feel like it's more important than ever. And so I wanted to bring some Bitcoiners together to, you know, discuss it, see what everyone's perspective is, and maybe we can add some nuance and, and rationale to a topic that doesn't receive enough of it, in my opinion. So let's just get a quick go around on intros. Izzy, why don't we start with you and then we'll get rolling. Yeah, sure, mate. Uh, long time Bitcoiner, um, came out of the Bitcoin closet about just in the pandemic, actually, uh, sort of upset me a little bit and uh, came out, decided to fight the good fight. Started uh, as CEO at Amber App and Volpay at the beginning of this year, and uh, just haven't uh, haven't looked back. Nice, John. Hey, thanks for having me. Long time no see. I am currently CEO at Synonym, and I guess my relevance here is that we do a fair amount of research and thinking and design for. Uh, tools for reputation, webs of trust, things like this, and facilitating anonymous identity. So hopefully I can help. Nice. Fractal? Thanks for having me as well. And I think of myself as a Bitcoin-only artist that's kind of working to spread uh, that Bitcoin maximalist gospel to the world. And I work pretty much in physical mediums, uh, like wood and mirrors and use lasers to make all the stuff, basically just trying to use art as a medium to tell stories across time and space and language and trying to encode uh, information that I feel is important to preserve. Uh, maybe my relevance here uh, would be that I've kind of been working as an anonymous artist for well over a decade at this point. Um, so maybe I have some some thoughts relevant to, to the discussion at hand. Sure, well, maybe one place to start, you know, given that you are the only anonymous person on this discussion why are you anonymous? pseudonymous Pseudo <laughs> yeah, pseudonymous. pseudonymous yes pseudonymous. that's yeah. actually a, a very important distinction uh, with the understanding that this pseudonymity is basically a spectrum and really there's no way that i feel like i could achieve a perfect uh, uh, anonymity just because of mistakes that i've already made in the past even if i had forward-looking privacy that was perfect i probably have messed up somewhere uh, greatly in the past that that would just come back to bite me but i just do my best i try to think of it as trying to be uh, uh on that spectrum more to the side of the difficult side than the easy side basically if people are going to be attacking uh, i figure they're going to always look for the low-hanging fruit and if you're kind of faster than the slower guy that the bear is chasing then the bear is going to basically eat the slower guy and you know hopefully you'll make it to live another day so why am i anonymous kind of goes back to I've been using the internet for so long that just originally like using your real name on the internet just seemed like such a crazy idea that everybody was weird guy 5107 or something like that. So it just like, I feel like originally there was just a concept that you just didn't expose yourself online. And I kind of have carried that from the nineties and the eighties into, uh, you know, what I'm doing nowadays. And it's just, it's just become kind of a, of a way of life for me now that I just kind of think in terms of, what ways am I exposing myself? Um, because everything is a, is a matter of digital hygiene. And, um, you know, there's just so many ways that you can expose yourself and be attacked nowadays that I just figure like limiting it even a little is probably in my best interest. So um, really, I know it's probably a losing battle, but I'm just doing my best here. When, when you say, and by the way, guys, just hop in all over the place. Don't wait for me to prompt you. But Fractal, when you say um, minimize attack, like what kind of attacks do you envision or are you referring to there? 
Um, I mean, there's any there's any kind of attack that could be basically just pwning your devices, um, just basically drive by stuff that you randomly happen upon where it just, you know, you may become part of a botnet for no unknown reason, um, which really anonymity, I don't know that that helps a lot with with that. Um, but just thinking in terms of those things, but certainly um, maybe like the five dollar wrench attack might be helped with a, a little bit of pseudonymity. You know, if people aren't explicitly aware of what you look like, you're, you're a little harder to kidnap and a little harder to to five dollar wrench but really i think if you're specifically targeted there's not much hope nowadays that like if you're specifically targeted people will probably in most cases find you um but i'm always looking at different attacks and also it could just be an attack on your time for example if you like if everybody kind of knows what you look like and then they can always come up to you and harvest your time and uh, if you if not then you can just kind of walk around and um, not be bothered so i don't know yeah. there's, there's all kinds of different attacks that i'm worried about um but that's a great question. I don't know if I elucidated them very well, to be honest. I feel like, you know, and this may allude to the work that John's been doing, but like there's such a broad spectrum here, right? So some people have attempted to minimize like all attacks, you know, their email address, their address, their banking information. You know, they tried to be have as, you know, private and online presence as possible as one can in this world. And that, you know, means using certain software and not signing up to certain services and all that kind of stuff because. They want to minimize the degree to which they get caught up in, you know, any of those issues that come from leaked data, hacked data, all that kind of stuff. And I'd say, like, maybe we're not as much or initially we're not addressing that cohort, because I think what when I heard Peterson's comments as they came up and the way I especially in light of COVID, the way I think about it is a lot of those people, a lot of anon accounts on Twitter, let's say. They probably are not using graphene and exclusively losing using Bitcoin and all of these other measures to take to really, you know, be perfectly anonymous. They probably have a bank account and have an email address and have a cell phone plan and all that kind of stuff. They just want to be able to express their opinion online without any blowback. And in the last, well, during the COVID era, the blowback was so severe. They, I mean, you could you basically couldn't say anything counter narrative without being, you know, having a temporary ban or being deplatformed entirely. And not only that, but if you were using your real identity, that bled into your real life. If your employer saw something on Twitter or Facebook that you were against mandates, that you were against lockdowns, you were against anything that was the dominant, you know, uh, sacred narrative of the time, then and this was a case for a lot of people. They lost their jobs. They, you know, their livelihood was affected. They were socially ostracized in many ways. And so it became way more than just having like pristine digital hygiene and, and being private. It became like a matter of your livelihood for people that simply wanted to express ideas online and not have their name attached to it. And so that, actually that's actually keyed well, in on probably the this main what surprises reason. me about oh, Jordan Peterson. Sorry. Um, this is this is what surprised me at Jordan Peterson's take. Like he was somebody that you know he's that doesn't he has to do like re-education or something in Canada because of his opinions. Now, granted, he's already like crossed the threshold. He's public. He's not going to be able to stop being public. If he tried to be private, he would have to start all over. Um, so he's not thinking of it that way. He's thinking only of his own position. But surely he can see that. At some point, the rabble or the people that he thinks should not be allowed to associate with real people, he could become one of those people someday. Like they could decide to oppress him. Uh, X.com could decide, you know, to, to ban his account, and he might have to start over too as an anon. And I think that, you know, I don't know. When, when I first started in Bitcoin, I was much more introverted. I wasn't doing podcasts and things like this. And I actually had like two previous identities that I used before I came out as my real identity. Yeah. Um, and the reason I did, I came out was because I kept, I just learned that I was always going to be like a vocal community member as I, the more I participated in Bitcoin. And I, and like the first time I started becoming really well known, at least I thought I was compared to, you know, before. And I was like, okay, I have to burn this identity. I'm going to start using a new one. And then I, that happened and it just happened again. And I was like, okay, like I can't keep doing this, like this value here. And I want to build my reputation. And I noticed that after I burned the first one, nobody cared what I said anymore. You know what I mean? I had to start all over. And so you, there's a lot of value to building a reputation. And Jordan is right about like 
the accountability that comes with that, that causes people to act responsibly and like they have skin in the game. And I think that's really what he's trying to get at is he's worried that like these people yeah. are, have a cheap entry point where they can just for free come and attack people that they usually wouldn't have this kind of status or access to. Um, but censorship and forcing people to KYC isn't the answer because all Jordan is doing is appealing to an authority. He's saying, somebody exactly. police me, you know, somebody police these people. And yeah. he, knows, he knows how that can go badly. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what's kind of, so, Izzy, do you want to say something? No, go ahead, John. I'll, I'll wait for you, man. I was just going to say that. I mean, every, a lot of people have remarked on this, but I do think it bears repeating that that's what makes his stance kind of so surprising, not only because he's received so much blowback and were it not the case that he was so popular and was so well-funded and, you know, was so influential that he could fight off those attacks. Like <clears throat> this thing with the Ontario College of Psychologists or whatever that's, you know, prosecuting him in some way now. What if he wasn't a multimillionaire with, you know, millions of followers yeah. that could put pressure on that institution? What if he was just a random therapeutic, uh, you know, a clinical psychologist, and he had a, a practice at his home, he was making a few hundred thousand dollars a year, he had a family to take care of. And because he said things against whatever narrative on Twitter, his livelihood was at stake or his license was revoked, then what? What, what does that person do? They don't have a, a soapbox to stand up, they don't have a loudspeaker to, to broadcast to the world. And so for that reason, it's surprising, but also because one of the things, and again, like I say this with a tremendous amount of respect for the man, but one of the things that he's known for is his study of authoritarian regimes and practices throughout you know, the 20th, 20th century, let's say. And it, it's, it was strange that one, COVID was a bit of a blind spot for him. You know, He basically uh, complied along with the narrative for a time, and then he kind of switched when he realized that compliant, you couldn't comply your way out of it. But again, I find it surprising that 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 wasn't known earlier for him. But also, again, to John's point, that, that my biggest gripe, and we, we can talk, well, let's, in a bit, we'll talk about the, the pros and cons, let's say, of being private versus being public, because there's obviously a rationale for the latter as well. But I, I, I find it surprising that despite his uh, study of authoritarian regimes, when an issue like this arises, with, where there's clearly a better technological solution to this so-called issue, if you have one personally or subjectively, that his, his approach is to invoke authority. Whether that's the authority of you know Twitter and Elon, or whether that's the authority of the state, because I I, I can't pull up the tweet right now, but I've seen him say things like you know they should be uh, it should be illegal to X Y Z you know express something online or as a particular anon account, and I'm thinking like bro, can't you see that if every time there's an issue, something that you don't like, something that you deem counterproductive to some particular end, and you invoke the authority rather than invoking a technological or innovative or individuated individualized solution, you're contributing to the very you know, problem, albeit on a spectrum, but it's the same sort of spirit that you're so critical of when, it's, when it reaches its zenith or, or apex in the form of you know, complete tyranny, let's say. Um, that was what was surprising to me. And it's still surprising that he kind of doesn't seem to realize that his approach to rectifying this issue, I think, is more that way than finding individual solutions or technological solutions that people can enact on their own. You know, like instead of telling Elon, you should segregate all the blue checks from the non-blue checks or all the, the, like the real identity versus the pseudonymous or anonymous. Why don't you make that a feature of the, the app so that people can better cater or filter their experience or personalize their experience to themselves? Why are you appealing to the authority? That's what, you know, that's one of my big issues with his, his stance on the issue, on the topic. Yeah, it, it really is pretty simple. Freedom is basically self-responsibility and self-enforcement. If you rely on somebody else to do your enforcement and or expect that, then you are becoming dependent and thus can be oppressed, et cetera. So uh, X already does give some of this feature only for notifications. You can filter by verified. Obviously, this is not very useful because there's not a, a great majority of people verified or paying for Twitter, basically. Um, and yeah. so the, the, the answer, you know, the, to translate what I just said into how to use Twitter, 
it's basically just aggressively muting people or just not reading notifications and, and only reading notifications from people that are verified or that you follow. Unfortunately, Twitter doesn't give you granular uh, ways to actually curate your feed to your satisfaction once you actually try to self-enforce because you want to do things like only allow people to reply if they follow you or if you follow them and they have some of these things but not all of them and so it makes it very difficult for you to choose for you to curate your own feed and that's the only answer it's just every individual needs better tools to be able to curate their own data data coming in on their own terms and thus it's not censorship it's just your own preferences and and I think that he maybe doesn't realize or wants to take, do the work to do that. And so he's happy to outsource it. This, this is a bad path, obviously. So I find this really uh, interesting. There's, there's myriad levels to this. And I'm really curious to explore all of them with you right down to the base of it. But I identify with John in the sense that I was for over a decade, that guy that um, had no accounts, stayed anonymous, didn't want as, as anonymous as possible, didn't want any footprint at all online. Um, one bank account, but yeah, won't go into how that, how that was uh, set up, but uh, nothing was really linked to me. So I was very much on that path for, for a very long time. And then when COVID hit this, this uh, whole pandemic, I had had a, a medical diagnosis prior to that, which, was a was a rare blood cancer and so it set me up that i i sort of faced a fearlessness in life and when the pandemic hit i was just uh, similar to john i was like well i'm gonna i'm gonna put myself out there that's exactly what i'm here for so when looking at what's what peterson has said i find it interesting to look at both sides and to explore that with you guys because i can see his point Unlike you, John, I didn't really resonate with him. I remember when everything happened around Evergreen, but I thought he was more intellectual than he was uh, sort of a man of truth. So personally, I didn't resonate with him. I didn't read his books. I, I haven't met him like you. Just to be clear, start. just to be clear, do you, do you mean University of Toronto? Because Evergreen was Brett Weinstein. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It was a long time ago. I remember. I, I remember when that came out, but I really haven't paid a lot of attention to him. I just didn't resonate personally with his. Um, yeah, fair enough. I, I, I found it quite heady, and I didn't find him <laughs> someone that I, that I wanted to sort of um, digest. I have a lot of friends that did, but uh, and I understand Jordan has done a lot of good for a lot of people, but this particular move didn't surprise me a lot. And I, it was interesting because I didn't know whether it was something along the lines of, is he not technical enough to understand this? Or is there something inside that is kind of that govern me harder? Let me, let me look for this. Um, I think I he's think just not both. empowered. I think he's just not empowered. I think that he doesn't, he hasn't been in conversations like this. He doesn't know the kind of research people do. He doesn't know the edge cases and where where harm can be done, where good can be done and where, you know, he could just have his own ability to curate himself. Um, he doesn't know what it's like to have your reputation taken from you, um, your identity taken from you. And so he doesn't know what it means to have to basically need a path to redemption. Like you need to be able to start over. You need to be able to redeem yourself. And you should be able to do that by shedding your identity entirely if you want to. And you can have identities for context. Like I can be Twitter John and I can call myself, I could have just called myself Bitcoin error log and never used my name and never showed my face. And people would just know me as that guy on Twitter. And in real life, I would never be able to apply that reputation to other situations because there was no connection. And so I would have, I would make that sacrifice to silo these parts of my life. But you're going to have to be able to silo plus your life more and more, I think, with the way the internet is going, because you're going to have centralized censorship and the government coming, I think, down harder and harder as time passes, where you could have situations where they're making you have to like reveal your identity to use Wi-Fi at Starbucks or things like this. And you're going to want to be able to choose what, how much of yourself you want to reveal. And one more point in the rant. And this all relates to actually how privacy actually works. A lot of people think that you can like improve or increase your privacy, but it actually works the opposite way. 
You can yeah. only lose, you can only lose privacy. And so you need, to, you need systems that work that way, that are additive systems where basically if you're participating in any network in the abstract, literally, it doesn't matter. You're always revealing some metadata to at least one other peer. Otherwise it's not a network and you're not acting. And so when you act, it's in, in managing your privacy is simply managing how many witnesses there are to each act that you perform. And I think people ha should have the right and do have the right, you know, inherently in physics uh, to be able to do this. And so, yeah, that's that's the way I see it. Damn, yeah, you guys dropped point. a lot of different concepts there. There was like, uh, I, and I have thoughts on all of it. I don't know if uh, uh, Go I'll for jump it. into them real quick, but kind of John was starting with, you know, one of the needs of anonymity is just to protect people's livelihood for unpopular opinions. And I guess I neglected to bring that part up. But part of the art that I used to do was heavily psychedelic um, and in pro psychedelic. And also like some of the art actually included like exact recipes, like one of my things, like if you follow all the steps, it'll tell you how to make 31,000 doses of really good quality LSD. So like, um, <laughs> I was trying to preserve this information, like, hey, if they take the internet away, we have like this stuff encoded in a different way, that's maybe a little more subversive. Um, so I also had a day job where this may not have been fully appropriate to just like have this be so out front, but it was something that was important to me, like on a deep level, like I felt like this was a message I wanted to spread with the world. And, you know, how was I going to do this? And since, you know, I was already like unknown, like it was not really a big deal to keep doing this art unknown. And also like, I feel like at this point, kind of the art speaks for me. So to speak to kind of what Izzy and to hear Izzy and John actually say they kind of went from Anon to non-Anon in essence, because it was able to help them have a greater effect. Um, I find myself in a, in a different position. Like I really enjoy the anonymity and I'm in a position where kind of the art, I want it to speak for me. Like, I feel like I'm super unimportant and people really don't even need to know who I am or what I think or anything like the art stuff is really supposed to be what what's delivering my message for me. So in a, in a position um, of that type of thought, like I, I really thought that that was an interesting exploration because to me, it's really mind boggling to see somebody just say, hey, well, I'm just going to be OK with this now. And like, it's also awesome for me because it has these benefits that I couldn't harvest before. Um, so, yeah, I think that the siloing that John talked about is super important and it's also very beneficial. Um, on many levels and I, this is just a great conversation and thanks for having me so that was all i had <laughs> well you bring up one an interesting point and just you know quickly one of the things about peterson's situation even though he has the capacity to fight back he also has a massive following right so he, he's probably yes. experiencing the trolls and that kind of stuff more than us but again he does feed into it. You know, he'll often retweet someone with 30 followers who said something abhorrent and he's like look how look at the crazy bad behavior it's like bro don't retweet them, right? You like if if you if you have I was going to say I don't even think he wants what he says he wants. Right. If, this, if you have the time Twitter to retweet so it, then mute it or something. Yeah, right. Well, I was going like, to ask you guys if we should define like what is his actual problem here because I looked through like John sent me a bunch of his tweets and it looks like he's just basically whining about internet trolls and to me like those are basically just part of life. Like you have to expect the haters to come along and you you kind of have to roll with it. Like there's not a big deal about that. But like, what do you guys think his problem is? Just because so, I'm probably getting this. Well, he, from he, Fractal, I I actually felt it was a it, it was a projection of his own experience. What. You know, his his, his explicit issue, just I'll jump in real quick, Izzy, but his explicit issue is that he thinks that the, the you know, the number of so-called troll demons or dark tet tetrad masochistic, uh, you know, psychopathic yeah. type. Can you define dark tetrad? I hear the word a lot, but I've I had to look it up. And yes, uh, <laughs> yeah, I actually had to look it up. And it's a, basically defined by four characteristics. And he brings these up a bunch in the tweets. Like the one is Machiavellianism, right. narcissism, yes. psychopathy, and sadism. So yes. those are the four parts right. of the dark tetrad. And yeah, like I had never heard of that before. And his, morning, so his, I, I his concern, up. his expressed concern is that having such a high concentration of such personality types and the behavior that comes from them in the the public square the open dialogue is disruptive to the you know the health of whatever it is we're doing here society or the online conversation or national stability or whatever frame we want to look through so he thinks like because there's no cost to being ridiculous or abhorrent online to you know to embodying any of those traits that fractal just mentioned because there's no cost to it there's more of it and it's destabilizing to healthy productive beneficial conversation 
Um, that where there is no cost, he should do. assign no value. It's as simple as that. Like, why what is he you... assigning value to things that he does not That's respect? A good point. Why, why does he care? Point. Like, it's all on him. He's choosing how to respond. He's a psychologist here. Why am I explaining this? He decides <laughs> how to feel about what, you know, how to react and what he values. Yes. And he should just dismiss these things, not retweet them, not reply to them. But, now, I'll give him one thing. It sounds like what he wants is for Twitter to give him a filter by, you know, again, whether they're uh, some some parameter. I don't think that uh, a blue check is going to be a good enough parameter for him because it's not it's pretty low threshold. Like I would pay eight dollars a month to troll Jordan Peterson if that was what I really wanted to do. Um, <laughs> like it, it's not a big deal. <laughs> like um, so I, I don't think it's going to work as he thinks. I think what he really wants is a more relative system. He wants but what, what he doesn't realize is he will have to be the one to curate that. If he, if he chooses an additive network, it means he has to seek out which feeds he can read and he'll have a lot, lot less to read, no chaos, basically no new information. And so he, he's gonna be really stuck and actually probably lose popularity. He needs this chaos. He needs you know the injection of new people, new ideas. And he just needs to understand that like, if he places zero value on an anonymous account, then he should respond that way by basically not responding at all. Yeah, but I, and I agree. There's there's two aspects to this. There's his own experience and preference. But again, he's expressed that his larger concern beyond the just annoyance or or uh, whatever about his own experience is that he believes it destabilizes. Yeah. online discourse, the public domain, society generally. And that's the one that I have the bigger issue. Well, with. this is like Russian campaign manipulation, right? It's like you're worried that there's going to be either bots or AIs or even government, you know, uh, initiatives or just a, a mob of spontaneous people that happen to all be the Doc Tetrad. You know what I mean? He's worried about this, you know, corrupting things. It's not a absurd concern but it is one that can be mitigated by all the things that we already discussed you know it's like just don't place value in those things but how do you get society at large to like understand everything we discussed that's maybe where he's giving up he's saying like i don't think we can ever create a situation where everybody is going to not be exposed to things they that they that they would unanimously agree they would you know with me that they wouldn't want to be exposed to but this is just also subjective and he's not he's not respecting that some people love trolls some people love being trolls hanging out with trolls like it's a whole culture if it's not for him he should just stay out of well, it well he he always says that i mean that one of his biggest gripes with all the moralizing you know and the, the crazy clown world stuff that's going on outside is he always says it's very date who gets to define truth who gets to define like what's right or good or acceptable and he uses that as a criticism Me, to you to critique you know, all these that's people that's 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 that are that are putting that are engaging in censorship he uses that critique and i it, it seems like he's not realizing the degree to which he's using the same subjective yeah. appraisal when he's judging the so-called troll demons that's why i say it's a little bit of a, a projection on his part that there's some sort of blind spot in, in him that doesn't realize that what he's, it's almost um, a juxtaposition of what he's, what he said in the past of what he's doing now. But to carry on from John's point, there's an interesting um, underlying thing here. I, at the base layer to this, you said the trajectory of where you see this going could only get worse, John, based on the centralization of these entities and things like that. I, I see it somewhat similar in that in the human endeavor right now, we're almost in a point of, the, there's this immaturity in a sense of, of how we should or shouldn't act towards one another. And because of the fiat slavery that we've been involved in, there's, there's a lot of people in pain. And like you said as well, some people just like to be trolls. You come out of that 4chan environment into now, and some people just really, really enjoy uh, taking the piss. But then on the other side of that, you see what happened in Australia during the COVID pandemic when there was a woman on Facebook who basically spoke her mind and police showed up to her house and took her livelihood. So there's all sorts of these ramifications of, of, of what it means to do that. I don't know that it's solvable, but at the base for me, I think on one side it comes from fear. There is fear of I don't want to put myself out there because X or Y could happen to me. Um, 
Whereas you might have these sort of giants in, in humanity that go, I'm fearless in the sense I'll, I'll, I'll put myself out there who as, I, who as who I am and say what I want because I understand the consequences from that. But not everyone is like that. If you have children or you have X amount of Bitcoin or you're a public profile or even someone who has a job and you're concerned of, le- of losing that, then my feeling is you should have the right to like no one should tell you that you can't be pseudonymous or anonymous as much as you want to. Those are the base layer things for me that um, there is a well, great sort of fear there in the, in the human endeavor where we are right now. But at the same time, no one should dictate to John, John or Fractal what you should or shouldn't do, because that's a very slippery slope. Well, I would say the nuance would be each individual should dictate their own terms. And so it, it shouldn't be outsourced. It shouldn't be a third party that gets to be the authority. And that's the only solution that's fair in all of this. Because I, I yeah, I, if I, I can censor you all I want in my world, you know what I mean? I don't want, if I don't want your data, if I don't want you reading my data, at least not directly from me, I have that right. Like, I, because I am the source and I am the consumer. And so it's always the counterparty that determines, you know, the subjectivity or the value, et cetera, whether to censor, whether to care, whether to delete you, block you, mute you, et cetera. And that needs, the situation needs to be set up that way. And I I don't think we'll have the the same problems. Um, Jordan Peterson, you you mentioned earlier, and I wanted to throw this out there that I had actually never heard of him until about a few years ago. Um, And he was already famous. And I I heard of him because of, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this genre of music called Meaning Wave by this guy, Akira the Don. Akira the Don, yeah. Yeah. And that's how I heard of Jordan Peterson. I was like, oh, these are actually really nice, succinct points. And the music is nice. You can can go for a walk, you can work out to it. Like you can work to it. And so I was just really into that music for a while. And so I was actually a pretty big fan of his while just through the music. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I didn't read read anything from him, didn't watch his video. But then, like now, lately, I'm seeing like he's turned into almost this like uh, he's just going to hatch into a supervillain any day. He's like got all these dark, <laughs> brooding pictures, sitting in thrones and wearing weird <laughs> outfits. Like I'm like, what's going on with this guy? Like, there's something. Something is kind of like taking him a little bit. Uh, he's come a little bit back down to earth somehow. Well, I mean, to comment a little bit on his uh, career arc, let's call it. I can imagine it's somewhat difficult to stay grounded and humble when you're giving speeches on the daily to sold out 6,000, 10,000 person stadiums, you're making millions of dollars, the internet, you know, you've got opportunities everywhere. Like, obviously, that's going to at least impact your perception of yourself. And it's probably difficult to stay stay grounded. So I've noticed the same thing. There, There was one particular Make It Beautiful, I think was the one I listened to like a lot for a while, because really nice song, a really nice message. But to your point, I mean, I, I take a lot of, it seems like a lot of his online, you know, commentary these days, there's like a, a, a weird, aggressive, over, like overly angry tone to it. And it's, you know, but I don't he, think he's hurt people, hurt people. And I'm not immune to that either. And, you know, people say that I'm me and I'm cruel in the way I do things. I try more to be explicit or direct than ever, you know, insulting. <laughs> But, you know, I, I, I reciprocate the moment somebody tries to be insulting to me. I, I do not hesitate. And I can see that obviously Jordan Peterson has some kind of trauma that he's dealing with. Yes. Um, and, and, and he's maybe even actively feeling traumatized from the situation. Sure. Um, again, I'm not a psychologist. But, but the, the reason why works. I bring it up is because... Um, the way he's acting sometimes, right? Where he's like kind of being kind of vicious. He's He's being quote unquote mean to certain people and maybe we would all agree that those people are absurd and deserving of that level that kind of rhetoric but my point is that a lot of people do or have and would consider his engagement trolly demony you know would consider it overly aggressive would consider it machiavellian and all those other types so again it goes back to this point about how subjective it is millions of people have accused him written articles made documentaries about him being that very same thing and so were the shoe on the other foot, again, did he not have that level of influence? Would he want to have his voice segregated out from everybody else? Or would he want to have to put his identity on the line and his livelihood in order to express himself? And I think the answer is you know, pretty obvious that it would be, no, he, he, he wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that. And so you know, one of the things that Fractal brought up 
that again, I think, you know, perhaps a blind spot for him is that he often talks about truth being kind of like his North star philosophical principle, basically, you know, I've heard him say many times and I largely agree with it that, uh, speak the truth and whatever happens is the best thing that can happen. It's a statement of faith around the truth. Now there's obvious nuance there and we can get into it, but again, like I, he holds the truth in very high regard. And my, first of all, I curate my online experience so that the trolls and all that stuff just doesn't bother me whatsoever. Like Bitcoin Twitter is a bit of a microcosm, right? And I don't have as many scammers, impersonators, all that kind of stuff. But obviously there's a lot of noise in the system. And I just, operate in a way that anyone who's in that category, they don't get any of my mind share. They don't get any of my attention. They're either muted or I don't follow them or I don't read the tweets or I don't read retweet them. So there's there's that element. But my my broader point is that especially in an era where the the noose is tightening in terms of censorship online, I'm willing to take 99 troll demons if it means that one is going to say a truth that everyone else is too afraid to say or that you know they can't say or you know you it's a burner account that just keeps popping up so that they can reiterate a point that everyone else is being coerced or intimidated out of saying which again was the case a ton of times and ton of instances during during covid and still and so if you revere the truth to that extent which i I'd like to think he's sincere when he says that. And I, I certainly, I certainly revere the truth. I'm willing to take 99 pieces of noise out of a hundred to have someone potentially say something that really needs to be said that other people can't say. And so again, this is why it's surprising to me that he would take that approach because if you truly revered the truth, I would think you're willing to take the bad with the good. And I think you would have a faith that if that were allowed to take place, the bad would eventually be, sidelined organically they would be pushed out of relevance because people if it's really noise and this is a critical distinction it's a subjective uh, assessment but if it's really noise it would be sidelined noise gets pushed to the fringes because what's actually valuable gets focused and concentrated on and again i think his his dismissal of the importance of in this climate people being able to speak the truth absent uh, reprisals to their livelihood or their life in, in any other way is a huge blind spot. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I've noticed and feel uh, about his position. I do wonder if he would have ever said that if he had already, if he already had better tools to manage things. Like if I, if I have a particularly hot day on Twitter, like the past day, actually, <laughs> like I am probably muting, Every day, John. I'm probably muting more than a hundred people in a day. Like that's what it takes to even have a readable feed when you are actually like getting tons of like people disagreeing with you or mad at you or or violently agreeing with you. Like anything that people are passionate about, you're gonna get tons of people that just say the stupidest shit. And yeah, it's it's often, but not always, anon accounts. There are many accounts that are just you see the guy's picture, you go to his profile, it has a link to his like website of his like lawn mowing business or something. Like they're real people and, that do this too. But you have to have a strict policy if you want to have you know a usable Twitter. Um, I actually just retweeted a tweet I made yesterday, just in case anybody's listening live right now, um, which is just I I, I realized that. Nobody probably ever tweeted something like this that I could see, but it was like so obvious to me. So I thought maybe it would be useful, but it's just called how to curate your X feed. And it's like a six step little algorithm of like what to do, like how to handle a tweet. And it's like, if you feel this way about it, you know, mute. If this is, if it's happening repeatedly, uh, unfollow, mute. Uh, if you feel, if you feel, uh, what do I have here? Embarrassed, threatened, enlightened, or empathetic, follow. And if you just use these little systems and are religious about them, then you will have like, you, you'll love using Twitter. I, I really like, I really like using Twitter in a debate format. I don't, I can't say I always feel good after using Twitter, which is maybe another reason for, you know, the, the way he's thinking of things and saying them. It's a, it's a hostile environment sometimes and you're going to behave in a fight or flight mode. So I want to bring something. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Frankton. I was going to say I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum because I never block or mute anybody unless they're just right. obviously a bot or a scammer because 
to me, I like to hear, I just like to see the dissenting stuff. And kind of like John was saying, you might see that one truth out there that maybe wasn't the thing you wanted to hear. But a lot of times those anon accounts do deliver on those one one liner truths that kind of need to be said. So there's some value, not that an anon anon account couldn't do that as well. But um, I just I just use Twitter in a totally different way. Like I basically like to get I like to get everything coming in because it is an adversarial environment and I like to be yes. in an adversarial environment. My source of truth in essence is my Bitcoin full node. Everything else is suspect in the world. So I don't trust any of it. And in fact, to think that we would interact with an internet that is anything other than diluted, debased and polluted is kind of ridiculous to me. Like the segregationist comments are kind of silly to think that you could segregate the internet. Yes, you can sit, segregate these wall gardens like Twitter pretty easily, but um, you know, the internet is just out there and it's 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 aggressive and it's you you kind of have to be um an internet native to kind of wander through it and i think there's nothing wrong with that um there's nothing wrong with the the stuff that john's saying like i actually really in, enjoy a lot of the points that he's brought up like how what peterson's doing is basically an appeal to authority to basically have somebody else kyc so he doesn't have to take the self-responsibility to curate his own digital environment so your own domain um and so i think that that these are all interesting points and, and everything's valid. It's just how we all choose to use it is different. I don't disagree with anything you say either because like my, everything I just said as far as how I handle and what I do is a product of how I use Twitter and you mentioned you use it differently and a product of like the, the, the type of content that I create. And so when I'm saying unpopular opinions or dispelling misconceptions, well, people get much more active and passionate and I just wouldn't be able to use Twitter if I didn't mute the people that that create noise all the time. And so when, when you have like a day like I had in the past day and you have like thousands of notifications, like you know that if you don't take the time to mute those people today, that when you do this again, you you may have 5,000 and it's just all noise and you can't find the people that are actually trying to engage or say something interesting, maybe refute you. It's just like, no, you're an idiot. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. It's like, I, I, I'm never going to care what that person's going to say. You know? so <laughs> no, your account is super volatile. I give you that. that and, and I love you for it. And definitely, I, I feel like uh, the tension that you create, because I read your stuff sometimes. And I'm like, what the fuck is this guy on about? But like, no, I, I think that you provide a valuable service for, for us. Um, I kind of lost my thought there. So whatever. But yeah. I just want to take a step back because one thing that came up for me then was truth. When <clears throat> when John Vallis, when you when you were talking a moment ago, you actually said the word truth about eleven times, and I find that really really um, this. My experience of truth is to know myself, and in knowing myself, it's. Um, Similar to fractal, like I, 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 whatever comes my way, I'm, I'm fine with that because I know who I am. And when I brought up immaturity in, in the beginning of this, with all due respect to Jordan, because I do think he's been a very, from what I've seen, he's been a very important voice for people to grow. But I feel that he's on a path of growing and to stand up and expound what truth is. I think it's something that he went through on his own journey. But at the end of the day, I don't find um, a lot of truth in that. I, I sort of find it him grasping intellectual concepts around truth. So it didn't really surprise response to to what um, to being anonymous or non anonymous on the internet. Can you guys relate to that, what I'm saying about truth? Like if you look at someone like a Mahavira or a Zarathustra or even Gautam Buddha or someone like that, they the truth comes from a different place. It doesn't come from an intellectual sort of place. Does yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And it Just, actually reminds me what I was saying a second ago about John, where he, I was saying that his account is volatile. But on my account, like in essence, I'm posting art. And, and so a lot of people are giving positive comments. Like so most of those notifications, I don't want to mute or anything. So I don't have that same same thing. But there are a bunch of people that are haters and they don't like my stuff and they don't like what I'm doing. And I actually like to hear all that stuff because a lot of times it's it's a sense of truth that they hone in on something that maybe I'm fucking up or, you know, not everything's valid. And you can kind of take it with a grain of salt and you throw away the ones that aren't valid. But if you do find one of those haters that gives you some truth that like reconfigures the way that you're you hey like 
perceive reality, uh, that can be valuable too. So the, I, I do see the true thing there. And sometimes it's not what you want to hear. And that's kind of like what you want to get in there. So I, you know, just that, that was kind of where I was going with that. I can see how John's account might not that value one quick that, for me. I One quick note, guys, it, it just started raining here. So if I drop out for a second, it's because my, my power glitched out and the generator is kicking in. So just keep going if, if I drop out, but John, I'm I think you want to say something. A question for you all. So one of the things that Jordan said when he was talking about um, when he was when he was talking about this issue, I think it was on was it a Piers Morgan interview? I watched a few clips today that were floating around from uh, three or four months ago, and he said, with these demonic internet narcissists, trolls, tetra, the, the people in their basement, he he used the example that if if someone said that to you in public, the, he, what he said was, these people would get punched in the face. Now, that's an interesting thing because you, it's an interesting argument. You hear that quite a lot, but I don't know if any of you are, are fighters or have ever been fighters. It's not going to happen. Even if someone comes up to you and says something very confronting, um, very few people will, will punch someone in the face. It, is, uh, it takes a certain type of personality to to go to that level. So I don't know that that's really a, a valid argument. I just wanted to put that out there, open up dialogue around uh, I, I, I'll have to dispel that, at least anecdotally, as somebody who has been punched in the face more than once for his words. You have? What, what is it that surprising? Well, <laughs> more I, than I actually, once. I actually don't, I enjoy martial arts a lot. And, you know, um, so I'm not, you know, I'm familiar with, fighting and stuff like that but i i don't right. like seeing jordan frame it that way one because right. you know what i don't like him insinuating that like that's how things are resolved in meat space should you do if someone comes up and says something abhorrent to you or something like that in meat space like if they're threatening you and you need to defend yourself or something or threatening somebody else like sure it's a different scenario but if you just like have diametric diametrically opposed views or even if they're being aggressive i mean i'm sure we've all been out on bar streets at like 3 a.m and there's you know that guy that group of guys that just wants to get into something and he calls you a pussy or a fag or anything like that and it's like well that that either triggers you and you 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 get involved you say i i don't care about your words your words mean nothing to me, especially now that you, yeah. you've said these. So they don't anger me and I don't want to be involved. And so I don't I don't think it's wise of Peterson to make it seem like that's the meat space version of these online interactions. And I find it a little bit cheeky that someone as uh, non physically imposing as him would insinuate that that's how he's used to resolving things in life or that that's like the first thing that comes to his mind, because I, I don't feel like that's how he would resolve such issues in meat space. I think yeah. that I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt on this and, and say that I think he's just trying to convey that people act more responsibly, more responsibly when they should be held accountable. Of um, course, I is. don't. Of course, I, I don't know. I don't know how. Violent but it's he is it's too much. I think where he wants people to be. Yeah, it's, it's, probably, it's probably too much. much. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to mention to that sort of intellectualizing the 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 truth of the matter if you will because similar to you john i've been in those situations and what it takes is a very direct eye contact and saying hey let's just let's just calm down and people well not everybody's like that and when there's alcohol involved situations can be much different and that's that's really the problem with the situations that i'm mentioning is it's mostly drugs and alcohol that resulted that were contributing to the violence um why are you, you know, being why are you being mean to drug addicts why, why are you provoking people who are I, drug I, I don't want to tell the stories because you won't believe me and it's so uh, i'm just not going to tell them <laughs> um and, and do, so do you think there's a fear with with jordan like what why do you guys think he would actually really put himself in that position to say, this needs to be this way only? I, I, People need to KYC AML. Well, I, I think that, you know, getting back to the, the perceived truth that Fractal and uh, Crypt mentioned, like truth is not an absolute thing necessarily. There is a consensus of what the truth is. There is an observable truth. You know, there are ways that we decide what the truth is for ourselves. 
Now it can be very difficult to like, or absurd to try to refute something that seems like it's true or reality. But oftentimes, you know, our reality becomes upheaved when we learn new things or we discover new, you know, aspects of physics or whatever. And so there is a certain consensus aspect and, and, and required observability to the truth. And so what is the nuance that I think Peterson might be missing is that there's even sub subjectivity in that. And he needs to be careful confusing his confidence with like the absolute truth. Just because he has a confident mental model of the way he sees the world and the way it interacts doesn't mean that he has discovered the truth and now he is like conveying it to all of us and, and, and should just expect us to eat it as is. Um, there's nuances to these things and there's a sub subjective aspect to it. So I think he may conflate his mental model with truth um, because it serves him so well and he has so much confidence behind it. I don't know if that's too abstract. But no, I, I think it's a good point. Totally and one, one, one thing that I, I wanted to mention before it's, you know, it's a bit of a departure from what we were just saying, but um, the other issue with, you, know, you say like, okay, I want to segregate the anons because there's no cost to anonymous, you know, comments online and therefore their tetrad behaviors and so if we could just remove that, then everything would be hunky-dory. But you're still going to get haters and trolls, even with their, their, their real or verified identities online, right? And so what you're actually saying, you, your issue is not with if they're presenting themselves as who they really are. Your issue is with the behavior. You're saying, I don't want that behavior. That behavior is destabilizing. But what happens then if you get the same behavior, but with people that are actually showing their real identity and they're verified, do you then obviously you want to censor that behavior to some degree. So now are you invoking an authority or at least the spirit, you know, what you're getting at is on a spectrum and, and what's the next step is saying like, Oh, well that didn't work. I'm still getting a lot of the same behavior, even though people are verified as their real identity. And so we need to do something about that. And so where do yeah. you draw the line of censoring viewpoints effectively versus acting like it's not a viewpoint censorship. It's a, some other reason. It's so easy to, deride people based on their behavior and say, oh, they're, they're dark tetrads, a word that you know came up, I don't think, very many years ago and based on a few psychological studies. It's like, well, that's a real easy way to get rid of a problem maybe for you and something to the point about truth, something that you think is destabilizing to the public discourse, but maybe it's not. Maybe the net benefit of anonymous accounts is actually positive. And that would probably be my opinion. I know it comes with a ton of baggage, but and this is a tale as old as time in some degree. I mean, pen names have been used forever, right? Because people yes. wanted to express yes. dissenting views against the backdrop of a paradigm or, or, yeah, or imagine nobody should be allowed to read books by pen names. You know, right, like exactly. all authors must be identified. Right. I so there was always there was there was, a, <laughs> there was always a cost to expressing an opinion that was counter to the dominant narrative. Yes. Maybe, you know, you get burned at the stake in a prior era. Maybe you get hung on a cross in a prior era, whatever it may be. And so people used pseudonyms, pen names, in order to express ideas that they felt were needed to be expressed, or at least they, you know, they, they felt they were truthful and they had a maybe even a moral obligation to express. But they did so behind a wall of pseudonymity, be, pseudonymity because they believed that there was, there was going to be too many repercussions for expressing that view. So this is a tale as old as time. And I feel like... Yes. Focusing on, you know, the label of tetrad or or the the qualifier of verified identity or not is missing the point. You're actually trying to discriminate against a certain behavior. And where do you yes. where is the actual line there? So you take it to the next step. You've segregated it, it off. Well, what happens John, when you the, still get the same the, behavior? The, the only there, moral way, sorry, the only moral, I just quick on it. The only moral way to be exclusive or to discriminate is to do it yourself. As soon as you involve other people, you're basically bullying and oppressing. Well, I, th th I think we're saying the same thing, John, because the line is at freedom. And th that's what the line is. And freedom means, number one, you have to know yourself because to have freedom, you, you have to understand how to be responsible. And that's why I said at the beginning, I think at the base of this, there's sort of an immaturity because this is a, um, a real Western sort of argument. If you look back in... in um, even if you look back into Mahabharata and some of the Vedas from India, you find this this has been talked about for thousands of years. It's not anything new, but it is new with us on the internet, which is enveloping the whole world. So I feel it's 
going to be a segue that's going to cause us to either wake up or live under a totalitarian, to, you know what I'm totalitarian. saying? Totalitarian. Uh, a, a, dystopian, a dystopian nightmare. And I think to, to your point, John, like where's the line? The line's at freedom. And freedom means that you don't get to tell me what I can do. And to have the ability, as you said, and as John said before, to either mute the people in that particular, whether it's Twitter or wherever you're at, or to, as Fractal said, just let it be like water off a duck's back. But when we go down the pathway of that needs to happen, because this is how I feel about it, it's, it's never going to end good. Yeah, yeah, you guys are definitely saying a similar thing, and I think it's very cool to hear it put bo both ways. But yeah, it's in essence, you're you're having someone else tell you what what to do or what's okay, rather than deciding for yourself. And then so sometimes that may work in your favor, sometimes not. And um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to be said there, and and we we touched a lot of interesting ground there. One of the things that I think that was interesting for me is that as like the pen name idea is very interesting because uh, the pen name kind of takes away that that the aspect of who the person behind it is. And I feel like, I guess that's kind of what I, I would be doing is using a pen name in a sense. So I'm using that as the identity to produce the, the work that I'm doing. And, you know, that allows me a cer certain amount of freedom, but that also gives you a certain amount of um, trust to overcome. Because when you do put your, your personality and your face behind things, like people tend to like associate a certain level of trust. Whereas with you, if you are, you know, pseudonymous, then you kind of have to build a brand through, I think, being trustworthy and being like, uh, you know, kind of doing ethical, good business, because it's so easy to burn any reputation online, that I think like, there's a lot more work in involved in building these, you know, anon or pseudonon accounts, because um, you, you really have, you're basically building a brand behind a pen name, like something that doesn't exist. So there's no reason for people to trust you anyways, with what you're saying. So, um, so you just have to basically build trust by right action. So I think there's a, there's, there's a, uh, there's both sides of it there. So I, I really, this is a pretty uh, deep conversation in many ways. Yeah, I, I can sympathize with that a bit because like, I mentioned earlier that I had, you know, pseudonymous identities before. And lately, I, there are some things that I, I'm thinking about doing, you know, in the Bitcoin world that I'm thinking, man, I wish I had kept one of those identities and kept it up, kept the reputation up for it, because I don't want to go totally anon and just be like a nobody to do these things. But I don't want to be me to do them. I want to I want to remove John from the, the judgment of these initiatives and see and give them a fair chance to float without my identity attached to them but i'm now i'm worried i'm just like well if you do it as a total or non it's like it's so low value and because in my head that's how I yes you have it. to start from zero that was a great that was yeah. what, what brought it up before was how you said that how you kind of burn those other old accounts or the one account and and that you realize that yeah once you're the new account no one cares what you're saying so that that's what you have to overcome so that's really really a which, which is just it. another point that supports the notion that there is value in the ability to be pseudonymous or anonymous obviously yes. otherwise it wouldn't exist and just the, the final point on the pen name stuff i mean how many first of all how many great works would we have not have had if you know people couldn't write under pseudonyms i mean i'm sure there's a list of books somewhere that we all deem like fundamental perhaps to philosophy or political science or or just whatever thinking in general that were written by people that didn't use their real name but the other thing and this relates to peterson's work Peterson basically talks about the, the fundamental constituents of reality being chaos and order, right? And you need a balance between the two. And, and a lot of philosophical schools, you know, frame things up in a similar way. Order is knowledge, is structure, is, you know, organization, is form. And chaos is, you know, the thing that threatens that structure, but also is where the novelty that you need to revivify that structure comes from. So you need to find a balance between the two. And in my opinion, you could construe this scenario in a similar way like yes all the the so-called troll demons the anons maybe they represent a type of chaos to you but they're in, in and in this there's, there's probably many examples we could pluck out here but one way in which these pen names and pseudonymous people have one of their functions has been being subversive like let's go back to the founding fathers and the things they were writing in advance of the revolution for example they were using pen names so that they could be subversive without putting their own neck on the line and that subversion was a it was a chaos to the existing order of the time, but it was also the novel, valuable potential that allowed something else, something better, a a 
better form of order ultimately to flourish, you know? And so I, I feel like he's, even though, and he's articulated that kind of like fundamental parameters of reality so well in, in the book Maps for Meaning. I mean, it's one of my favorite books ever, but it seems like he's not realizing the value in the chaos in this particular issue. That's a great way to put it because I, I think of chaos as basically, you know, the same thing as mutation. And I think of this all like, maybe Jordan can maybe understand it better through this map, mapping it to this thing, because it's, it's actually what's going on. This is all about evolution, a changing environment, and DNA surviving. And so you need mutation in order to have a chance of encounter of dealing with new environmental changes and surviving. And so you need chaos and you need order in order to counteract the chaos of the environment at large. In other words, per life persisting is order, but in order for life to persist, it does need to have a relationship with chaos. Um, and, and he's basically just denying this by saying, I want to cut off this and this piece of how reality works so I don't have to deal with it. That's why I think it's um, sort of an immature take, as I was saying at the beginning, that there's something in his learning curve that hasn't um, experienced yet that understanding of the truth that this... Yeah, I mentioned it as he's not empowered. I was trying to be positive. Um, unusual for me, but I think he's just not <laughs> empowered. I think like he needs to like listen to conversations like this or read... read uh, you know, research from smarter people than us that puts it more eloquently, whatever. But he needs to empower himself by actually like realizing that there's some dissonance in between his beliefs and his behavior and his recommendation here, and that he should resolve that dissonance with, you know, knowledge. And then he would be able to make better recommendations and just look like a better leader. Yeah. And, and, and promote alternative methods of taking that responsibility with which we're going to break into, you know, in this conversation a little bit, because obviously it's relevant to everything happening in Bitcoin land. But another one of the things I wanted to mention about um, the value, I suppose, of privacy or pseudonymity or anonymity, and this fractal, this goes to your point, and I think it's a very valid one. It's not just, you know, protecting, let's say, the individual behind the expression, the art, whatever it might be, but it is the case that some ideas, whether they're in physical form, in the form of art, whether it's just words on a page, the medium can taint the message or influence it if taint is too negative of a word. So like, if you have an idea, if you have a philosophy, if you have a thesis, if you have a piece of art, and you know who created it, then you make an association naturally. Maybe it doesn't influence your view of the message or the art that much, maybe it does. But I do think there's a value in just being able to take ideas, take the message absent the medium, right? So, so cause like, let's take an extreme example. Let's say Hitler once wrote something, you know, really quite sensible about how to structure your day for maximum efficiency. Right. And we, we, if we didn't know it was written by Hitler and he said, wake up early and eat your eggs and get your exercise and get a good sleep and make sure you manage your time properly and all that kind of stuff. We'd look at that and be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty sensible. Like maybe, maybe that could be valuable in our lives if we integrated it a little bit more. But then if we see like signed Adolf Hitler, we'd be like, oh, like, you know, would we be able to so easily separate the medium from the message? And I think one of the benefits of being able to have things that are not associated with their creator is that we get to experience it in a, in a more pristine form, right? Where it's just what it is, absent whatever association we might make with it. And John, that was kind of your point about wishing you had like another burner account. Perhaps one of the motivations is you wish you could put something out into the world. I don't know what you had in mind for it to be, but maybe with less associations to you, your history, your past, your reputation. And there's a tremendous value in that. And just saying like, no, nope, fuck it all. Like you better show your face if you want to express anything. How much would we lose in, in that domain? And, and how much would otherwise messages or art or whatever that we could enjoy or learn from or what have you, uh, would we not be able to do so in the same way? I think it would be a detriment. I think even Jordan Peterson can appreciate, judge the idea, not the person. Exactly. Um, I, I think that he probably has been mistreated in that way himself. So it's, I don't know. Yeah. I don't really think I have anything else to say on that. <laughs> you, you mentioned, you mentioned, uh, wanting to talk about different, uh, formats for this. What were you yeah. looking at? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not yet though. I want to do one more. Um, so one thing I wanted yeah. to bring up was, so we've been talking about the, the legitimacy basically of, of having 
non-verified or pseudonymous people being able to express themselves and being, you know, somewhat accepting of that, or at least not invoking some exterior authority to uh, curate your experience, but having that be something that's an individual responsibility. Um, to steel man in a bit, I think we should talk about why why one might be public. So I'll, I'll just give my brief example, not that it's, you know, N of one basically. But um, when I started doing the podcast, I mean, I had thought about just being a non because I mean, anyone who's in Bitcoin has probably moved the chess pieces out a bit to know at least or at least to have the thought like, oh, maybe maybe there is some risk to me if I'm public about this at some point in the future, if things get really hairy, whatever, maybe I become an enemy of the state, maybe I become a target for hackers or attackers or what have you. And I, I had a couple motivations. One was, I ended up thinking, I'd rather have basically the social capital of being known by more people so that if, if I did get in a hairy situation, I had more relationships, a greater network, if you will, that I could say, hey, guys, like this happened to me. One, I want you all to know it. Two, can anyone help? Like that having a bigger army, you know, to use that metaphor, maybe is is beneficial. So if if you could make the case that if everyone took that approach, it wouldn't be so easy to sideline that person on Twitter that said, you know, like there shouldn't be vax mandates because instead of, you know, just a small group of, you know, uh, pseudonymous individuals saying it, millions of people that were going to stand up with their face and their name said, no, I think this is wrong. And maybe that would have had a material impact, or maybe that would have changed the public discourse, or maybe that would have changed, you know, the nature of compliance and that kind of stuff. So I think one is like hiding, it's kind of another way of hiding in a crowd, but you're you're hiding in a crowd with your with your actual identity. And I think there's- But if you think about the panopticon effect where they would design prisons with that central tower that could kind of look out onto all the prisoners and they just, they wouldn't know if like you're you're watching them or not, but you change your behavior just by by understanding that you're, you're exposed. So um, it's, I don't think that just having everybody go by their own name is going to make them just more likely to stand up. I think it would make them less likely to stand up. Um, yeah, well, yeah, we're still, that. we're still manning the, Ooh, there's the, the a cost, there's a cost to right being right anonymous or pseudonymous. Like you were saying, like, like there, it comes at a cost because maybe you can't go to a larger network for help or things like that. So there, there's always trade-offs and, and structuring whatever right. identity you choose to have. Totally, totally agree. So but yeah, it's, it's still manning the point. Wait, I got one more. I got one before you guys jump in. And the other one is, you know, if you have, let's say, a reverence for the truth, if it's kind of like an article of faith for you in a sense, or if you believe that, like you may have the mentality that I recognize that speaking the truth will have could have detrimental effects to me, you know, my livelihood, my job, my social situation. But maybe you just believe that the right thing to do, right? Like the ethical, moral, thats your, this is your framing, is that to say what you believe to be true and to do it openly, damn the, the consequences. And maybe if you take that attitude or archetype to its maximal extent, you get a type of martyr archetype, which is someone that says, I'm going to say what I believe to be true, or I'm going to yes. act in, in a certain situation, yes. despite the fact that you're going to take my life for it, which again, yes. both, in, both in myth and in actuality, we have many examples in history. And so how, how legitimate and how powerful is that act to say, I don't care what you're going to do. I'm, I'm going to okay. use my face. I'm going to speak the truth because I think back to Peterson's quote, that is the way that you um, affect, that is how you make the best thing that can happen, happen by speaking the truth, standing by it, regardless of the, the consequences. And so if we're steel manning the case for being public, which obviously three out of the four here have have been have become public, then those are at least two in my mind uh, that I think are are valid. If you're making the case that like society would be better served if everyone didn't hide behind a pseudonym and instead put their face, you know, up in front, would that ultimately be better, you know, net circumstance to arise? John, let me, let me weigh in on the latter bit of that because I, I, I dropped at the beginning that I had a, a, a very crazy medical diagnosis, right? And when you're, when you're faced with death, which is what happened to me, it's, it's, a, it's a rare blood cancer, it's, um, it does something very, very, very interesting to you. Um, and I'm definitely in that place of, I, you know, I, it's not that... I don't care about the consequences. I, I know who I am. I know what life is. I know what can be taken from me and, and what can't. And in a way, it makes me fearless. 
And when I got upset during the pandemic, I was like, well, how do I use this fearlessness? And I remember at the time wanting to go down to the protests in Melbourne. And uh, a dear friend of mine said, you need to choose your battles. And my battle was, okay, so if I know the consequences and I only want to focus on the orange glowing light of Bitcoin, um, well, let me be an outward face. And as fate would have it, now I run a couple of Bitcoin companies. And you, to your point about standing up for truth, I don't think it's everyone's pathway. But I think if we have, have people who are willing to go to that place, it almost gives license for others to go, okay, um, I'll, I, at least I can stand up for some things that I believe in. But if you have children, if you have, you know, all these sort of other things in your life, you're going to be somewhat hesitant to, to put yourself on the line. It takes a certain type of individual. Uh, myself, I, I, I don't care. You cannot take what I have. You can't take my Bitcoins and you cannot take, my experience of who I am, I understand the ramifications of what it means to be truthful. So I could give zero fucks. However, I don't know that that's the path of, of, of every individual. As far as steel manning, I think, I think that we actually, everything we said is compatible with the idea that a reputation is valuable, that you know, maybe revealing yourself can have value as well because of skin in the game and things like this. So it, uh, while we didn't, while we didn't explain everything inversely, I think if you infer the inverse of what we said, it, it is the steel man, like, because we weren't trying to refute these values. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned uh, like martyrdom as like maybe one of the motivations. And I never used that word, but I, what I what I say sometimes is like when people say like oh why do you act this way or, or you're you're so ornery or whatever they want to you know whatever critical thing they say I say look I don't mind showing my ass so you don't have to in other words if I'm like I, I'm still I'm still the same introverted John from before Bitcoin I don't enjoy like being putting myself out there I especially hate like going on stages and things like this but and so the way it is for me is like if I'm going to put myself fucking out there, it's going to fucking mean something. And I'm going to say things that cause new ideas that, that reveal gems that I have discovered in this process. And it's just going to be purely about like value for me and, and value for me might not be the same as everybody else, but that is a big part of it for me. Like if I'm going to waste my time and I'm going to put myself out there and face these risks, it's got to mean something. And so that's why I behave partly why I behave the way I do. And so I don't think Jordan is crazy to think, oh, like a, a person that's willing to show their ass is somebody that I can maybe assign some low level trust more easily to. That's, that's, that's fine, of course. Like a, a person that can be identified can be, you know, uh, oppressed, can be punished, can be found, can be punched in the face as maybe Jordan would like to do in, in some situations. Um, that's, that's the accountability part. There is a higher degree of accountability, but it's not removed when you're being anonymous, um, you know, especially yeah. when, especially when you have to have like a phone number or when Elon is like, uh, uh, what was his word? Like, you don't have a right to, uh, you, have, you can use Twitter, but you don't have a right to reach. You know what I mean? Like, so your reach may be limited if, if you not, are. Not reach, lawful, yeah. not awful. Oh, yeah, yeah. Something oh, like that. That's such an awful, awful statement. <laughs> I hate that statement. Um, I, I get it, but the problem is, like, decided by who? You know what I mean? Who, who gets mm -hmm. to decide what's awful? Who gets, it's just not right. And, and if Elon thinks that, or Elon or, or the CEO, I forgot her name, um, if they think that they can be some kind of authority and do a great job at dynamically determining what's awful for their users, well, they're not really any better than the previous establishment, and they're just basically going to end up being an arm of the government, most likely. Yeah, well, that's how the previous establishment came to be, like that kind of yeah. a, a, a mindset, and then it just grows into this monster, you know. And 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 to one point of clarification, that you know, and I think you understood the point, but just to be clear, I wouldn't say to be a martyr is a motivation. What I meant is that it's a representation of elevating the importance of speaking the truth, subordinating everything else to speaking the truth, regardless of you know what comes to pass as a result. So again, both in story okay. and in actuality, there's been these examples where people say, look, I'm going to tell the truth and you're going to hang me for it. Maybe Socrates is a good example, something like that. And you do it anyways, because you believe that's that's the right thing to do. But I 
I, I think one of the points, this goes back to what John said earlier on, and it's probably a segue into kind of solutions here and what Fractal has been doing, but you want to be able to selectively re reveal yourself, right? Depending on what context or what circumstance you're in, maybe you want your reputation or an element of it to be known in one domain of what you're expressing or what you're doing and not in another. So this goes back to like, let's say I want to detach my reputation entirely from, from something I'm going to write out in the world. And I just want it to stand on its own feet and be subjectively interpreted for what it is absent any relation to me. Okay. But maybe I want to engage in business, or maybe I do want people to know that something has come from me because maybe I want them to associate something good about me with something, you know, in the art or in the expression. And so to me, I see this to John's point about evolution, like the evolution of being able to one steward your own information to the to the extent that it's now possible in the digital age or maybe becoming more possible and then selectively reveal yourself as and when you deem necessary fit or by whatever means you determine that you want to i think that's ultimately the solution to this and you know if if nobody else has any uh, thing to say about what we've been discussing maybe we can talk about rather than just shitting on peterson or, you know, actually, I think we've been pretty fair and logical in in in, uh, in arguing his position or arguing our position against it, but also providing or suggesting solutions. Because as John, you were just saying, I mean, you it's almost like you it's an unsolvable problem. You can't have a central entity determine what's appropriate or truthful or interesting or good for a billion people, right? Each individual has to make that choice. And if you if if every individual just delegates that responsibility to the central authority, be it an algorithm, Elon, Jack Dorsey, whomever, it's going to degrade into a tyranny because you're going to try to normalize for something that can't be normalized across every dimension, because you're you know everyone everyone's too different and everyone's preferences are too different. So I don't know who wants to jump in on what to do about well, it. But I'd, I'd like to say one thing before we go into solutions, just to kind of flip the switch a bit. So. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you and what you just said. But let's say you're Elon Musk, for example, and you you own Twitter and your idea should be that, no, everyone has to be kyc in and AML, which I think personally is where he will take this. You own that business. So that's your right to do that. You see my point? If that's what you want to do. So where is it in this evolution, John, um, that as a populace you know, in, in the human endeavor that we go, hang on, let's all opt out of that because we actually value this. Uh, we actually have these values about what freedom means that if we do want to be pseudonymous. So how does that play into the, the sort of evolution of how we interact on the internet? Does it end up becoming all these split public squares or as we see, this um, Twitter being the main one, if Elon wants to make these decisions, how do you, how does that sit with you, John? There's a little bit of an issue uh, that is, is a nuance, which is like not all speech is actually legal. And when you act as a website and, and there have been different laws that have changed over the years and uh, around like whether or not like it's your fault if somebody posts something illegal or posts something illegal on your server. Like if somebody posts like child porn on Twitter, is it is Twitter in trouble? Um, if now now this is a very odd situation because Twitter now has to do some amount of filtering of this data in order to not uh, get shut down. And nobody would argue with them censoring child porn, or other than people who you know want to that care about that. But the, there's a there's a pretty broad consensus that nobody actually wants to support that. And so people support laws against that. They support violence against that. They're okay with it. So that's already in the door now, right? So now you have this huge forum, and. Elon isn't trying to corner himself into, well, I am a free speech business. In other words, I, I, have, I, I, I have free speech, so I have every right to say everything, and so do all my users. That's not a position he's taking. He's trying to turn X into the everything app, right? And so he wants all your payments here. He wants everything here. And this is only going to exacerbate this problem because now there's going to be like 
money service business kind of legislations involved is going to be, and they like to censor certain types of speech as well. And so the problem is just that we censor speech as a legal you know, thing that we do within our system. It's supported. It's not actually totally free. And so once it's not totally free, that means when you are a business, the larger of a business you are, basically the more centralized you are, the more of an arm for the government you must become over time. It's, it's not something that he can avoid. Um, so that, that's like a nuance that we have to keep in mind is you can't actually run a business and do 100% free speech. So what is the solution? Well, I, I don't want to rant too long because like we're actually working on a solution. I'm pretty sure after thinking about the dynamics of how all these things interact in networks and the tools that we currently have today and the tools that we're building, that we can at least create the system that would make this all operate correctly. I can't say whether or not everybody would use it or everybody will use it. And we're going to do our best to make it in such a way that, that makes that easy and appealing to do so. But it really takes everybody using an entirely open system where they decide what they see and what to reveal. And you have to basically re reboot the web using this system instead of the way that we do it now in order to make that true. You can't just like have both. Um, and so that would be really difficult bootstrapping, but generally like you could kind of infer what the details of the design of the solution might look like by the things I've been saying. Like the individual needs to be empowered to do these things. The individual needs to be able to express their subjective curation filtering of the data that they see and whom they directly share data to. And this is a peer-to-peer -peer system. It, it would have to, it, it can't scale in a global sense. So it's not a global system, it's a relative system. And it's the only way you can do it that's physics compatible in my opinion, but I think it can be done. Interesting. We'll get a few more details on that in a second, but I, there, there's one point, you know, cause in, in Bitcoin land, obviously we believe very much in Bitcoin and related tech or tech with similar principles. Um, and, you know, we think it's a solution to a lot of things, but there's one, you know, back to the compliance uh, issue, maybe it's a good analogy. Like if everyone just stood up with the real name and said, no, whatever the issue was throughout history, then the issue would have been it most often would have been over. Right. But there's, you know, there's a, there's the herd or the mass mentality where, if insufficient numbers of people do that, then everyone else thinks there's not enough people doing it. I'm not going to put my neck on the line. And therefore, something that in hindsight, everyone agrees was probably wrong or deleterious or they, you know, they should have been against. They weren't at the time because they didn't they felt like there was too much risk to themselves. When again, the irony is that if everyone just almost as a rule said, I'm going to stand up to it if it comes, well, most often the the mass that could stand up is larger than whatever force is seeking to impress or coerce them in some way. And so it's so so tricky. They, sure. But so let, me, let me, let me finish this one point. The, the analogy I would say is like, let's say there's things like Bitcoin and other stuff like John is developing or Nostra or things like that, where people could have more control over their money, the way they express or communicate themselves, but it's, it's, it's dependent on them taking responsibility for themselves and you know accepting perhaps maybe less functionality less network effect less in, you know there's always trade offs but people themselves have to make the decision that they value being able to speak freely so much they value being able to steward their own identity so much they value being able to selectively re reveal their information so much that they are willing to accept those trade offs and you know we probably all agree it's happening slowly especially the worst, you know, mainstream media landscape landscape gets, but it is you know, incumbent on all those people to value the things we're talking about sufficiently. And one would have to say that, you know, all the people signing up to X, willing to KYC everything, every single thing they do in their lives, obviously that's a implicit admission that privacy and control over their own information and the value to be derived from doing so is insufficient for them to actually make that decision at this point. There are so many more people. people. Go ahead. Well, I just, I, I just wanted to say that's what I was trying to intimate in the beginning about there is a level of fear there. You were talking about in mass, if people stand up, um, it's a simple matter of I will not acquiesce. That's the fear. 
like what is it in my life that I'm afraid of? Is it is it ultimately the fear of death or is it the fear of losing my job or putting myself on the line and being ostracized? And that's what I mean about there's somewhat of an immaturity in the 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 public sphere of this. Um, not a lot of people want to take that risk. I think yeah, that immaturity sure. has been cultivated by by nannying people with regulations and things like this. Great. And so so it's a really tricky thing because there are a lot more people that are okay with the things that we're not okay with than people like us. And so, you know, get bootstrapping a system, like I mentioned, is unlikely. You know what I mean? Like you, you basically have to find some other angle, some other incentive for them to start behaving this way. And that's something that we think about a lot as well is like, okay, like, how do we get people to actually enjoy this and be and have an incentive to use a system like this? Especially when you consider that, you know, John, you were mentioning earlier that if everybody had just stood up from day one, that we that it might not be this way. The issue is there are actual people that are actual dependents. And there, and there are the people that are dependents that don't have family that are still dependents. And as a kind of moral and caring species, we create systems to support them. And those systems eventually become oppressive. Even nonprofits become, you know, uh, predatory and things like this. So like you can't really remove this factor. You also need to account for dependent people that are legitimately dependent. And then the people that maybe are just too lazy to be responsible or just brainwashed or conditioned to be dependent. And how do you, how do you cure that? I don't think it's something you can do in one generation. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I definitely I, think the the latter group that you just mentioned is the larger. You know, there's definitely people that re, that are dependent and require someone else to take care of them effectively. Um, I would argue, and this is a whole other can of worms that we probably don't have time to go into, but given the nature and the power of the money printer and the people who control it, that apparatus, you know, the people that control it and the apparatus that has grown up around it, or the state broadly construed, has supplanted all the other things that otherwise would care for people in a nuclear family or in a community or in a locale, something like that, and to deal it, you know, to negative effect. And so I think if once that solution gets rectified, if it does do something like Bitcoin, then we will get a return to actually more local familial uh, caring of your, you know, people in your immediate environment and the care will be so much better. So those people that are necessarily dependent because for whatever reason, they can't be fully responsible for themselves. They will. they the, the thing upon which they're dependent will be much more caring, compassionate, less, less controlling, less tyrannical, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that that's my little yeah. my little quip for for Bitcoin. But I agree with the the broader point that there's always going to be people that are dependent, but accepting that that's the the minority, it it's just a matter of what people value, you know. And one of the things you, you made me think of this, not that I want to uh, insinuate that we should sacrifice the dependence, but one of the notions that Peterson often brings up, it, you know, and it, it's a it's a metric we all use explicitly or implicitly when we value anything. It's like, well, what are you willing to sacrifice for? What are you willing to give up? You call it exchange if you don't want to call it sacrifice, but you say, well, for me to get X or for me to do Y, I have to give this. I have to work this hard to create that. I have to pay this money to create that. And in that, implicit in that, is your entire kind of value structure, how you value things. Am I willing to sacrifice my reputation, my livelihood, my family's well-being to speak the truth, to stand up to tyranny, to you know build an alternative system? And those are all questions that we have to answer. And I feel like, you know, again, for a lot of reasons we won't have time to answer today, the the current paradigm that we're nestled within has devalued you know, focusing on making decisions in that way or being conscious of how our decisions are being made through a lens like that. And that has wound up independence being way more, let's say, upregulated than it otherwise would be because people are far less conscious of the consequences of being so dependent, of acquiescing so much of their power and responsibility or delegating it to somebody else, whatever that somebody else might be. Yeah, yeah. I, we have no solution for violence. Um, we have no solution for like our mortality as, as a you know object of violence. So I, I the only the only idea that I've come up with to try to to best address this is to, to also within this system that we're making to find a way to basically align incentives as granularly as possible. 
basically if, if everybody is going to the network and finding and getting what they want and associating with the people that they want and consuming the, the content that they're looking for, then they're not going to be concerned with people doing other things that they don't like. And if they are, it's because they injected themselves into it. They opted in. And so when you, when you, if you treat things as an additive network, you treat things with these kind of self-responsibility primitives, then I think you can at least minimize violence. But I don't think that Anything Bitcoin has proposed, anything that reputation or peer-to-peer uh, -peer web stuff has proposed removes that problem. It's always going to be a problem. There will always be you know, groups of people able to consolidate resources in order to oppress others with violence. And there's nothing that we can do about that ever, in my opinion. Well, the ancients would have said uh, the answer to that is know thyself. But that's a much, much deeper, uh, no say to Ipsum, it's a much deeper conversation. I, I've got a question and, and, and a statement. So did, um, did Satoshi set the, the principle here in that he did understand the system that we live in and how oppressive it can be, obviously, um, and remained anonymous throughout this in that, in that system? Um, isn't that sort of the precedent here? Because if... KYC and AML was was across the board as Jordan um, is sort of intimating that he thinks that's the best way forward. Then would we have a Satoshi? Um, and what would what would the world look like if we didn't? But then also, um, I'm very curious if, as we segue into, I don't know how much time's left, John. The solution based one thing that John Carvalho said was what he's working on at the moment. And it, it made me think that the martyrs that we talked about or the heights of humanity in the past um, were these people that were willing to sacrifice everything to stand up and go, I, I accept whatever consequence that you want to give me, but I am going to say X about society. Um, if we look at the myth of Jesus or the life of Jesus or however you want to look at that, those type of people. And what I found fascinating about what John was saying is he's working on things from a technological standpoint. Will we now, as a populace, because one person literally can't stand up, would it take something like a creation from John or, you know, another entity that we go, there is the martyr. It's a technological martyr, something that we can opt into, similar to Bitcoin, that gives us the freedom to express ourselves in a way that we wouldn't normally because of the norms of society that we live in now. Yeah, I, I, I hope nobody's taking the message that I'm trying to call myself a martyr. Um, I, I preferred saying, showing my ass so you don't have to. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know if what we're doing will be a good, the best design or if people will use it, but I do think it's worth trying. And I do think that I'm doing, and, and other people as well should do their best to just be as honest with themselves as possible as, you know, uh, doing their best job as they can to distill things down to primitives and think about dynamics like I've discussed today in order to actually achieve something better than what we have now. Because I don't think we're going to, or Elon is going to somehow like edit Twitter features enough to solve this problem. Um, and probably not even enough to solve it for Jordan, certainly not for us. Mm -hmm. I agree. And Izzy, to your, your first question or comment, in my opinion, absolutely. Whether it was intentional or not, we'll never know. But Satoshi was anonymous or pseudonymous. And he also, quote unquote, sacrificed, you know, presumably he had lots of coins, whether he sacrificed them intentionally or not, who knows. But again, those actions, I do think, imbue a kind of ethic into the genesis of this system. Because I mean, it's almost impossible not to. Maybe you don't give it much credence or credit. And so you don't read into it that much. But if you do, you say, well, you know, how would it have been different if he was not anonymous, if he kept all of his coins and spent them, if he, you know, did X, Y, Z things? And I think you're right to say it's not unreasonable to, to suggest one of the reasons why he was anonymous because he realized how subversive what he was writing in code and launching into the world actually was. And so he said, well, I don't want that heat. I don't want that heat. What if you know? Hitler made Bitcoin? Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let <sighs> so that that's actually amazing. You know, two of the points. One, I'd like this creation to stand on its own 
away from whatever reputation or associations with me. And two, this is a really a perfect analogy to everything we've been discussing. I, I think there's great risk to me. I will be targeted because this thing is such a threat to so many existing power structures in the world today that I yeah. need to remain anonymous if I want to you know, keep myself safe. So absolutely, I think Satoshi is a probably the prime example of what we're discussing today. Um, and I, I think that ethic has been imbued into the system, which is why, you know, perhaps all of us came here today to discuss this issue because we felt it was so important and perhaps it wasn't getting the right, you know, nuance or hitting the right points, you know, by Peterson or otherwise out in the discourse. So I totally think, um, you know, he, he, that was a emblematic or archetypal sort of uh, representation of the current time we're in, as well as putting forth a solution separate from his own you know, reputation or identity that seems like it's going to be very beneficial to us all. Yeah, I, I, I'm on that pathway as well. And I'm curious for, um, and that's a great conversation I would love to explore at some point in a different podcast. But yeah, the prescience of, of what he created and why and how he went about it is staggering. You don't mm -hmm. decide in 2008, oh, I'm going to be anonymous. There was some experience there. He, he saw the, the, what was it, Liberty Dollar and things like this get shut yes. down. So I, yes. I think that he had some experience to know that he probably needed to be, you know, uh, mm -hmm. without a doubt, John. I think without a doubt. And to have the, pre to, to, you don't decide in 2008, oh, I'm going to be anonymous from today. Because as you said before, you already have that, those back steps of a digital footprint. You have to have some prescience of I'm working on something that if it succeeded in some way, I need to cover the tracks because over time, it's only going to get harder because there's going to be more eyes looking at you and the technology to look back is going to become better. So I think it's a really interesting point. But be be before we segue into solutions, just wanted to ask Fractal something because he's, he's sort of like being – being uh, anonymous and pseudonymous and taking that route, like I have a lot of respect for that. I, I did that similar to Carvalho for a long time and decided to come out of the Bitcoin closet. But Fractal, if, if we knew who, like if Banksy wasn't an anonymous artist, would it have the same effect? And is there any relevance here if Jordan or someone like Jordan said, no, all artists, whether you're a street artist or not, we have to know who you are because you may paint something that is offensive or in some way disrupts the status quo of society. Oh, I think that's a great question. And I definitely think that uh, like John said, sometimes the medium can taint the art um, and even the artist's identity can taint the art in many ways. Like uh, even uh, John, other John said, Hitler could have created Bitcoin. So like, it's like, I kind of feel like, yeah, in many ways. And I see a lot of artists that look, the, they go the other way. In fact, like many artists will just post a picture of themselves with their art and hey, they're smiling and they're very like proud of it. And they like to do that. That's just not me in whatever way, I guess. So I, I know there's people that, that are, are fine with doing that. But to me, I think, um, yeah, I guess I think people would think my art is way more stupid if they knew what I look like. So <laughs> um, I guess just like I'm kind of hiding out so no one sees how like ridiculous I actually look. Um, because yeah, I mean, realistically, there's no benefit at all to showing what I look like to the world because it can only hurt my art in, in many ways that uh, realistically is the way I feel about it. Not exactly a, a novel example so much as another one like the other ones we mentioned, but you guys are making me think of graffiti artists, you know, graffiti artists will have their own tag. They're not, they're not tagging their first and last, their, their first name and surname, you know what I mean? They're tagging and making <laughs> a new name for themselves because what they're doing is illegal. Yeah. Um, and, and whether you think this is good or bad, but it's an example, another example. Yeah. Well, it's a great, it's actually a great analogy because you can make the case, some people do, that graffiti disrupts society, right? It, it, it makes the the city or whatever landscape look worse and everything would be better off without it one that's obviously a highly subjective view and two the reason why they they use tags instead of their names is because there are repercussions so again we, we keep coming back to that thing yeah. but uh i want to bring it home now but i i don't want to leave john you you already kind of mentioned it and i i feel like you've been Respectful, respectful of the conversation, not wanting to kind of shill, you know, your company and what you've been working on. But I think it is important to 
explain a little bit. I mean, I know we could talk for hours about the solutions out there, but we're talking about like the problem. And the fact is, is like the current solutions as are construed in something like X, I mean, as we keep saying, it's never going to be that platform where you can retain your privacy and your information because it's it's structured in a way that requires you to give up more and more identity to do what its aspirations are to do. And so if you're someone that that values their privacy or control of their information, you have to seek alternatives. And it seems like we're living through a moment or a landscape where those alternatives for free express, expression, free transaction, free publishing are emerging, you know, in a more robust way than perhaps they ever have. And so Nostra has gotten a lot of, you know, press over the last year or so for being a platform where people can express themselves more more freely with let without censorship and control their identity more. John, <laughs> I see you shaking your head. I know you've been working on, you know, an alternative. And so I just want to impress upon the non-Bitcoiners that are listening, because I think, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners will already know this, but that there are solutions emerging where you don't have to to you know, relinquish all your information. You don't have to be so captured. There's always a give and take. You give up less, you know, network effect, perhaps you give up less people that you want to follow being on the platform, but there are increasingly methods to express yourself in the manner that you see fit. And maybe we just take the last 10 minutes of this conversation to touch on some of them for people that aren't familiar with them. Sure. So I think in the case of Noster, um, I want to kind of take it from two perspectives, you know, positive and critical. Um, positive, it is one of several uh, key-based identity systems, or at least it utilizes that concept within its design. Um, and then it uses those keys to be able to uh, sign data and send it to a relay. A relay is effectively a website that doesn't have a, a graphical interface. It still has the data, it has all your data and it will render it for you on demand. It will send you the data if you want to render it. But Noster uses what's called clients to render the data. So instead of having, instead of visiting at a website and it loading graphics for you, you visit the website and it sends you all the data of the website and then your app renders the data. And so there is an improvement over Twitter in censorship resistance and things like this. But now I'll flip over to the, oh, to the kind of critical side, which is because this movement has been adopted mainly by Bitcoiners, Bitcoiners are projecting the learned behaviors of how to promote and defend Bitcoin to the system, but it doesn't quite map exactly. And so you're having what's the equivalent of Noster maximalists. And the issue with Noster maximalism is basically that the system is not complete. And it is not an ideal design. And I think even the creator will tell you that. I know he will. Um, and if nobody is speaking this way about it, it's because of this kind of mapping this behavior onto Noster thing. The, the, the shortcomings of Noster are that, like I said, it's just the relays are just websites. So the difference is now is websites can always censor you, right? Websites that grow big can be censored and you know oppressed by government, right? So your censorship resistance is, resistance is now a little bit iffy in that that kind of relationship, and then you say, okay, yeah, but but I can have many relays. Well, this doesn't scale, right? Like you can't have you don't want to have many Twitters, right? And you don't want to have many websites serving Twitter. People are eventually just going to gravitate towards efficiency, and they're going to end up being the most popular relays. And if Noster gets bigger and bigger, you'll see that more and more. And then the other critical side I have is on the identity side for Noster, they've done the absolute minimum. In other words, it's, it's a great step using keys as accounts. Um, and these don't have to be Bitcoin keys. They can be any kind of you know, key, cryptographic key pair. Uh, they use the, the Bitcoin curve, but they don't actually use these keys for paying each other. It's just a convenience thing, a familiarity thing. There's no advantage to it. But that's all they do. They just say, make a private key, make a pub key, and this is your identity. There's no actual design and thought put into the keychain and how to silo your identities and how to manage, you know, having accounts for different purposes. And then there's no there's no work put into being selective about who to reveal your data to and the things that we talked about earlier. So you've got like the primitive in place of, you know, I, I own my data, I generate my data. I am a key, I use that key to prove that I made my data. Um, and then I send this data out, but there are the shortcomings that I mentioned. And so as far as our system, we from the beginning 
have been addressing things from the bottom up like that, from primitives, thinking, you know, what is the holistic solution to make sure we don't miss anything? And I think that there are other people doing this too, like Web5, although they, they talk a lot less than they used to about reputation and things like webs of trust, which is another concept that we should probably mention here. Um, webs of trust are key identity systems that basically use some sort of way of instead of just signing a, a tweet and sending it to somewhere, you sign the, the equivalent of like a review or a score about somebody. And then if you can now aggregate these scores somehow, either locally on your own computer or on a server somewhere, if you want to trust, remember, you don't have to trust as much because these are signed messages. Um, and, but they can select, and remember, oh, another thing about Nostra and this, this method, selective censorship is possible as well. In other words, they can just omit data and the, uh, the end users don't know that the data has been omitted. So this is another shortcoming of the structure. Um, but yeah, where was I? Oh, with Web of Trust, once you establish people using Web of Trust system, you can now take that system and apply weights to it. So you can, if you think of like how uh, they, they used to say there's like six or seven degrees of separation between everybody on earth and on the internet, it's something like between three, two and three now, it's really, really small. Um, the, the amount of hops, minimum hops for you to connect to anybody on the internet. Um, if you think about that and you think about all the people and all the data on the internet as like all the noise, the full spectrum, you can use a web of trust to basically filter it down. You can say, apply a noise filter of your own design to be able to reduce all of the data and all of the peers to the set that you are the most interested in or the set that is at least large enough to find what you're looking for. And so these are the concepts that people use, that we use, except there's just a lot more to it. I don't want to bore you with it. Like once you start applying these and you realize there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do, powerful things you can do, and, and you can do them in very comprehensive ways. Well, so John, anyone who wants to learn more about what you're doing, is it synonym.io? Is that the? Synonym.to, synonym.to. So. Um, and we also have uh, slash tags.to, which is the technology that I'm talking about. But everything that is out there other than our mobile app, BitKit wallet, um, is, is pretty early stage. So it's not stuff that I would say you would build with unless you wanted to help us experiment. Um, it, it, I would say around this time next year, we plan to have a lot of you know, releases and announcements as far as the, the, the full slash tag system, applications demonstrating the system, things like this. Nice. Well, my final comment here is that I'm just, I'm encouraged, well, one by Bitcoin, obviously, but also that technology is being developed. There's sufficient motivation by, albeit a small cohort, relatively speaking uh, right now, to find ways to overcome, circumvent, neuter the censorship that I think we'd all agree has become, you know, rampant and overbearing over the last 20 years as, as the internet has evolved. And I'm encouraged that more and more people, even though there's still the mass that, you know, maybe hasn't found the motivation yet, maybe they never will, but it does seem like more and more people recognize the value of being, being able to speak what they believe to be true, being able to express themselves in the way they want to and not be beholden to the other people, other systems, other institutions, other authorities, and not be so threatened by them. And that, and that the options are growing, I think is only a good thing. So I uh, appreciate you guys joining tonight. Izzy, or today on Saturday, Izzy, you for staying up super late. And uh, I think we did a fair treatment of Peterson's comments. Um, now, how do we uh, get him to watch this? <laughs> that, that, okay. so I wanted to bring that up before we close it off. No, like he, he very well may watch it because I think John, the fact that he knows you um, and he's, he seems like a very open guy. My question is, um, how, how does he understand that the work that John is doing and some other people are doing are a better answer to this tyrannical censorship? That would be the, the question I would pose to Jordan if you are watching, like explore that ideology because at the end of the day, tyranny never wins. Um, the, the human spirit always wins. It's, it's why we're here. It's why we're still having this debate. You know, we, we've gone through this so many times in, a, in, in the past, and the end result is we, we come out of tyranny one way or another. And it looks like being in the technological age that being able to create things like synonym slash tags and, and what other people are working on, that'll be an answer for, for a larger populace rather than sort of a community where 
five or six men have to get together and sort of overtake the tyrannical powers. We need something that is more empowering now. But yeah, would like Jordan, if you're watching, maybe maybe check out synonyms and <laughs> see, see how you can add value there. Jordan, if you're watching, look at my ass. <laughs> Let us know what you think. <laughs> Well, even if Jordan does, I'm sure many other people will will you know let us know what we left out, and uh, you know we'll be wiser for it. Maybe have another chat about it again in the future. But did you guys, Fractal? You've been I know you've been a little quiet. Do you have any last words or anywhere you want to send people to check out? You know your expressions before we shut it down, and then over to the other two guys. Um, sure. Yeah, I did have a, a last thought that kind of we didn't really touch on. I'm not sure if it's relevant for Jordan Peterson, but maybe for other people um, out there. I do. And this is like very maybe I don't know if it's controversial, but whatever. It's just my own kind of thought that people have to be careful with posting pictures of their children and stuff like that online, because you're basically kind of robbing them of having dominion and sovereignship over their own digital identity. So for the parents out there, you just have to think about um, the sacrifices that you're making on your children's future and also of the dangers of just basically like creating an online record. Some people do this from the time someone's a baby until they're an adult. And just think of like all the data that that creates. Like if you just paint a picture of someone um, going over 20 years, there's just the, the vulnerability of having that out there um, without their own consent, really just a lot of times like children are trusting us to protect them. So I know this is kind of a little off topic so i appreciate just like kind of getting the, the chance to kind of throw that in there because i do think that, that that's a, an important aspect of privacy that not a, pe a lot of people look at is like the way that we damage other people's privacies and the way that we act so you know if you're at conferences and you're taking videos of people's faces and stuff like that sometimes like you know just little things like this like you know the more that you just expose other people online like like you just have to be thoughtful about that as well as the way that you expose yourself online and i'm sure if you guys want to check out my art just go check out fractal encrypt on twitter i certainly love that and uh, uh, yeah that's that's me so thanks for that and, and this is a great conversation thanks again for including me awesome john uh yeah I, I mentioned the websites for the business but if you want to uh torture yourself and read my tweets i'm bitcoin error log on twitter uh same on telegram although i'm not always very responsive on telegram because it's just too much input but um yeah check out uh, bitcoin error log on twitter or synonym.to for the company thanks nice Izzy, bring us home. Well, first, I want to say, Fractal, I love you. That's just so beautiful, mate. Um, yeah, that's just, <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm so glad you added that in. And uh, John, I love you as well, mate. The fact that you're working on these tools that that can possibly offer a solution. And Valis, mate, uh, I love you for what you do. We get to have <laughs> conversations like this. Thank you for for having me on and, and having this enticing conversation. And Jordan, if you're watching, I love you as well, buddy. And uh, I hope you can come to the light. Uh, for me, um, look, it's be as fearless as you can be without causing stress to you and your family, um, whatever that is. Uh, it's the whole thing is, uh, as Bill Hicks said, it's just a ride. It's a choice between fear and love. Choose love and go down that pathway as much as you can. And you can find me on Twitter at Hodler's Way. Um, as I said, I just took over Amber app. We're going to launch globally. So, yeah, the world is bright, glowing orange. Let's fucking go. I love it. Perfect way to end it. Jens, thanks again for joining. And uh, I'll speak to you all again in the future. Take care. Cheers. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, John.